In everyday life, we all have a sixth sense. Some of us are masters of it, others don't know it exists. We use it to make others trust us or love us or to help us keep our jobs. The clues are in our actions. You'll be shocked to find out what you're giving away. You will be amazed what you can discover about other people. I call these clues tells, a term that comes from the game of poker. Tells are central to the exercise of power. In government or in the workplace, they enable people to convince others that they have the necessary qualities to lead. Spot the right clues and you can use this secret language to read someone's mind. A tell is an action which reveals what someone is thinking. To win at poker, players need to work out what kinds of cards the others are holding by looking out for their tells. A tell could be the way someone holds their cards, or gazes at their chips, or scratches their nose. But tells aren't just found in poker. We all use them all the time. These telltale signs reveal the secrets that people usually keep to themselves. I read people's tells in all kinds of situations, and you can too, with friends, at home, or at work. And you can use tells to read the mind of anyone, including your boss, a movie star, a prince, or the prime minister. George Bush is anxious more often than his country knows, but how can we tell? Who outmaneuvers Tony Blair on his own doorstep? What has Prince William been covering up ever since he was a toddler? And having hidden the truth the first time round, how did Bill Clinton persuade America to accept his apology? If politicians knew how they were exposing themselves, they'd be horrified. Politics is all about appearances. It's not enough to be powerful, you need to look and sound powerful as well. To wield power effectively, leaders need to find ways to convince others that they're tough, dominant and healthy, as well as friendly, approachable and sincere. They need to acquire the tells of power. Political leaders try to show everyone that they're physically fit. That's because the public unconsciously infers the health of the body politic from the health of the leader. Notice the affected way that President Bush walks. He swings his arms up and across his body. This is the power walk. It exaggerates the male walking style by emphasizing the upswing of the arms and rotating the hands so that they face backwards. This makes him look tough, more like a bodybuilder. Tony Blair also knows the importance of looking the part. Soon after George Bush became president, he went to visit him at Camp David. We find Blair with his hands in his front pockets, trying to look cool something he doesn't do when he's feeling relaxed. He's doing it because Bush is making him feel uncomfortable. Later, on the same visit, we see him doing it again. Bush has changed into his bomber jacket. He's definitely up the macho stakes, and Blair is trying to match him. It's clear that Bush is calling the shots and that Blair feels upstaged. Once again, his hands seek refuge in his front pockets. He definitely isn't happy playing Tonto to Bush's Lone Ranger. The President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. As well as looking physically strong, politicians also need to look sincere. Bill Clinton has his very own trademark tell for sincerity. 
When he wants people to think that he's being sincere, he briefly narrows his eyes. I don't think Clinton is aware he's doing this. It's more likely that he makes a conscious decision to appear sincere and that his eyes narrow automatically without him knowing it. But it's a different story when it comes to showing his feelings. Here, Bill Clinton is the pass master. He doesn't mind being emotional in public. In fact, he seems to relish the opportunity. Clinton's emotional displays are often deliberate. Here, he's at the funeral of a cabinet colleague. He's laughing and joking, unaware that he's being filmed. Suddenly, he spots the television camera. He immediately stops laughing, lowers his head, adopts a mournful expression, and appears to wipe away his tears. Here, Clinton knows exactly what he's doing. But when it comes to deliberate tells, Clinton's pierce de resistance is his lip bite. He does this when he wants us to think that he's been overcome with emotion. The lip bite pretends to be an unconscious means of self-restraint, a way of controlling strong emotions. But its real purpose is to draw attention to his feelings. Like the time he asked the American people for forgiveness for his misdemeanors with Monica Lewinsky. On this occasion, he deploys the lip bite no fewer than 15 times in just over two minutes. I don't think there is a fancy way to say that I have sinned. I have asked all for their forgiveness, that I have done wrong. Because the lip bite is so discreet, people who see it don't necessarily notice it. This doesn't mean that they aren't affected by it. They are. They just don't know it. The only difference between a sinner and a saint is that one's found forgiveness and the other one ain't. Amen. Some tells are under our control, and we can therefore use them to create a false impression. But there are also unconscious tells that we don't know we are producing. The newly elected George Bush is on his way to his inauguration. He's alongside the outgoing President Clinton. You can see that Clinton is relaxed and that Bush is nervous. But why? What are the tells that reveal it? Look how George Bush is biting the inside of his mouth. It's one of his trademark tells. It shows that he's feeling nervous. It's what psychologists call emotional leakage. There are two things to notice about Bush's mouth bite. Firstly, it's a restraining, self-comforting gesture. Secondly, it's intended to be hidden. It's Bush's secret way of keeping his anxieties under control. If you were a poker player observing other people's tells, you'd try to memorize what they did at the precise moment that they realized something. This is the terrible moment when President Bush was told about the planes crashing into the Twin Towers. Look at his mouth bite. This moment confirms beyond all doubt that the mouth bite is what George Bush does when he's feeling anxious. If George Bush knew this, he'd be horrified. But what about British politicians? Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown has a trademark tell. It's one of his specialities. Touching his papers seems to give him a sense of security. When he's speaking, he produces an unusual display. Nigel, uh, in thanking you for your invitation, uh, let me, first of all, on behalf of the, the government and the Labour Party, join the congratulations uh, to Brendan Barber.
Most unconscious tells are linked to negative emotions, to feelings like anxiety, embarrassment, and insecurity. One place where you often see these signs is when people are moving from one situation to another. Tony Blair, for example, often plays with his cufflinks as he comes into view. This is a transition tell. It's a displacement activity which transfers his anxieties to a non-essential action. But the king of transition tells is undoubtedly Prince Charles. Charles has a whole armory of them. Here's a typical sequence. He does a tie fiddle, a jacket fiddle, a pocket fiddle, another tie fiddle followed by a jacket fiddle, and just like Tony Blair, a cuffling fiddle. Different people have different transition tells. Prince William is at Highgrove with his father. They are going to meet the press. Notice how William strokes the top of his head. This is one of his transition tells. He does it as he crosses a psychological boundary, the point in his mind when he comes on duty by entering the public arena. It's a sign of uncertainty. When the interview is over, he and Prince Charles walk back to the house. Watch how William touches his head again, almost at the exact same spot where he did it previously. It's like clocking off duty. The uncertainty is over. This is a classic transition tell, because the action only occurs on the way in and the way out of the situation, not during the encounter with the press. William's crown clasp isn't new. In fact, he's done it ever since he was a toddler. Camera. Camera. And then he has to be referred down to an A&E unit, which is absolutely diabolical. The they can't... Here, Tony Blair's being harangued by a member of the public. He's in real trouble. He's doing his best to appear composed, but something gives him away. Look at his chin. It's pulled back. This is the chin tuck. Consciously, Blair knows that she's not going to physically attack him, but his brain isn't taking any chances. It's protecting the place where she's most likely to punch him. This fear of being attacked is surprisingly common even among the highest-ranking politicians. It's a new day. Change is on the way. Politicians like Bill Clinton are fond of what I call the oxbow mouth. Here, the lower lip is pressed up so that the mouth looks like an inverted letter U. Politicians like doing this because they think it makes them look determined. But because the gesture stiffens the chin, it shows that he's unconsciously worried about being punched. The oxbow mouth isn't a sign of determination, it's a vulnerability tell. And that's why it was so prevalent during the Monica Lewinsky affair. Monica Lewinsky says that you used a cigar as a sexual aid with her in the Oval Office area. Would you be lying? Yes, no, or, or won't answer. I will revert to my former statement. Watching our political leaders, I've often wondered, do people become powerful because they produce the right tells, or do they start producing power tells after they take office? Watch Tony Blair campaigning to become an MP for the first time. It's over 20 years ago. He's very much in the shadow of the then Labour leader, Michael Foote. But look, even back then, his hands are slipped into his jacket pockets. It's not a power tell, it's one of Blair's leakage tells. Exactly the same one he used two decades later when as Prime Minister he met President Bush. It's leakage tells, those that reveal discomfort that politicians bring with them to the job. You don't, for example, see politicians doing the power walk until they've got the top job. They only acquire power tells when they get power. We've seen how individual politicians try to project themselves as physically strong, sincere and dominant. 
So is it any surprise that there's a hidden power struggle when world leaders come face to face? We've discovered how individual politicians use the secret language of power. But what happens when they get together? A handshake looks like a friendly gesture. But in fact, it's one big tell. Depending on how politicians shake hands, they come across as more or less in control. It's a power game with elaborate and subtle rules. If I were a politician trying to control the handshake, here's what I would try to do. I'm going to go for the upper handshake. First, I'd get onto the left-hand side and try to get my hand on top. Then I'd grab the other person's elbow. When the cameras capture the image, I'd be the one who's in control and who quite literally has the upper hand. Maybe that's why the Prime Minister looks so puzzled when I do it to him. Politicians who know what to do can use the handshake to put each other at a psychological disadvantage. The leaders of two superpowers are about to meet in the Grand Hall of the Kremlin. They're here for delicate discussions on each other's nuclear arsenals. But first, there's the crucial matter of the handshake. Who's going to come out on top? Way in advance, Yeltsin raises his hand so that Clinton has no choice but to place his hand underneath. Yeltsin completes his control over the handshake by grasping Clinton's arm. He has Clinton exactly where he wants him. Being on the left side of the picture exposes more of the politician's arm and subliminally makes them look more powerful. Here the German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder has positioned himself on the left, thereby assuming an advantage over his guests. But he hasn't bargained for President Clinton. Clinton reorients his body towards the photographers. He exposes his right arm and drives Schroeder backwards. Clinton is only interested in the cameras. Schroeder is completely outmaneuvered, and he knows it. There are two world leaders in this picture, but Clinton makes sure that it's a one-man show. The very act of touching is itself an important power tell. The most tactile of all modern leaders is President Bush. Touch for him is a way of connecting with people. It's also a way of asserting himself. Touch operates as a status reminder. Just after the American presidential election, in which he actually polled fewer votes, Bush met his opponent, Al Gore. Watch how Gore is ready for Bush and makes himself look more important. First, Bush gets in his trademark backpat, but Gore is positioned to score the advantage. In the race for the White House, Gore lost out, but on his own home turf, he's determined to win the battle to have the last touch. Such tells, loved by politicians, are also used by those who enjoy the power that comes from fame. Tom Cruise is being welcomed onto the stage at a premiere. He shakes hands with his host, and they both grab each other's arm. When the handshake ends, the host is still holding on to Tom. As he lets go, Tom comes back and pats his host. He's reminding the host that he's more important. For aficionados of tells, such displays create something of a spectator sport. After the familiar photo shoot, convention dictates that the host guides the visitor away from the scene, usually by placing an arm behind the visitor. Allowing someone to go through the door first is widely seen as a gesture of politeness. In fact, it's a doorstep tell 
a classic exercise in power that hands control to the host and puts the visitor in a slightly subordinate position. Somehow politicians seem to understand this. That's why they dislike going through the door first. Look at Clinton trying to steer Major through the front door of number 10. When neither party is host, these tussles can really heat up. That's exactly what happened when the Palestinian leader, Yasser Arafat, and the then Israeli Prime Minister, Ehud Barak, were guests of President Clinton. Arafat and Barak represented the opposing sides in the age-old conflict between their peoples. Watch what happens when they try to decide who's going through the door first. At the time, the media regarded this incident as a piece of good-humoured horseplay about who was the more polite, but the media hadn't read the tells. They failed to recognize that Barak and Arafat were engaged in a battle of arms control. Deep down, neither wanted the other to look powerful. They both wanted control. This kind of one-upmanship can take many forms. In 1992, Bill Clinton won the presidential election. On inauguration day, he arrives at the White House. The outgoing President Bush and his wife Barbara are there to greet the Clintons. On the surface, the Bushes seem to be the perfect hosts. But if you look more closely, you can see the secret language of competition. Notice how Bush locates himself at the edge of the top step, forcing Clinton to shake hands while he's standing below him. It's Bush's way, quite literally, of keeping Clinton down. Clinton responds by making a fuss of the dog. It's his way of showing where his true admiration lies. Barbara pats Hillary. This is intended to look like a friendly gesture. In reality, Barbara is reminding Hillary that she is still the first lady. History repeated itself eight years later on the inauguration of the next president. This time, the Clintons welcomed George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, to the White House. Bill Clinton positions himself strategically on the top step, extending his arm and forcing George Bush to shake hands while he's standing on the step below. Bush can't resist the opportunity to pat Hillary on the elbow, another example of the power touch. But George Bush gives something away. He's clearly overwhelmed by the occasion because when he thinks nobody's looking, he surreptitiously bites the inside of his mouth, his trademark anxiety tell. There have been other moments that reveal a hidden power game between these two men. Watch them trying to outstrut each other like a pair of muscle-bound bodybuilders. This is not how normal people walk. It's Clinton who manages to get ahead of Bush, but Bush won't be eclipsed. Watch how he gets his own back by sneaking his elbow in front of Clinton's. Such tells reveal the power games hidden behind the smiles. Kelly, you up for one more turn? To me, spotting tells is a way of seeing through what's being said to what's really going on. Once you can understand the secret language of tells, most mysteries appear in a totally new light. That's why I've come to Bournemouth for the Labour Party annual conference to put tells to the test. Studying the tells here should cast light on one of the biggest power dramas in Britain. The continuing speculation about the leadership struggle between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. 
Today, the Chancellor is giving his speech to the conference. Everyone is wondering whether he'll use the opportunity to position himself as the leader in waiting. Conference, can I ask you to welcome Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Rackham. The relationship between a prospective leader and the party is like a courtship dance, full of subtle messages. To lead a party, a politician needs to have vision. On the podium, Gordon Brown is like a general, rallying the troops before the battle, reminding them that their cause is just and that they have much to be proud of. Brown's emphatic hand movements are reassuringly confident. This is what you'd expect of a party leader. Best when we're bolded, best when we're united, best when we are Labour. Gordon Brown has sent a very clear message, both to the Labour Party and to Tony Blair. The morning after Gordon Brown's speech, everyone is wondering how Tony Blair will respond. Today, he's giving his annual address to the party. Will the tells show us whether he's a leader on the defensive who might be on his way out? Or will he project the dominance tells of a man who's in control? In many ways, what we're going to witness today is a kind of political version of a poker game. And that's because Brown's raised the ante. He's raised the stakes. And the interesting question on everybody's mind is, is Tony going to be able to match the bid? And it's very much a game of bluff, simply because Brown has put his cards on the table and we're now going to see whether or not Tony has the hand that everybody expects of him. But what's fascinating about all of this is it's not simply a matter of conventional politics. It's also essentially about the matter of tells. Does Tony project himself as the kind of person who still has the command of the party? Or does he leak out little tiny indications of insecurity, suggestions that it's time for somebody else to take his place? Look at that. That is a typical Blair tell. It's one of his trademark gestures. But that's not his only one. He's also using a variety of precision movements in order to emphasize his point. And he's using this very distinctive gesture, which in effect is a way of presenting his knuckles. It's a high dominance gesture. Notice also that he's using various stabbing and cutting movements. These are very much his trademark tells and they're all designed to create an impression of somebody who's in control and who's also a powerful politician. And you know, when the Tories lose an election now anywhere in the country, they say it's not their natural territory. Tells teach you that clues are often to be found in places where we don't normally look. If you want to find out who's winning the poker game between Blair and Brown for the heart of the party, you don't necessarily look at Blair who's speaking, you look at Brown. It's said among political journalists that Blair and Brown are kept separate so that you can't film them together. We took this rare opportunity to do something quite unusual we studied Gordon Brown's tells during Tony Blair's speech. From the moment Blair appears on the podium, Brown starts producing distress signals. For example, looking down at the ground and pressing his tongue against his cheek. Brown's cuffling fiddle is a displacement activity. Here it's not a transition tell, but it's still a sign of anxiety. During the 50 minutes or so that Blair was on the podium, Brown plays with his cuffs 29 times, 
a sure sign that he's feeling anxious. Brown also produces a number of self-comforting and defensive gestures, like smoothing his hair, touching his face, biting his lip, and folding his arms. There are 55 rounds of applause during Blair's speech. If we do a little test and compare Brown with three of the ministers around him, we find that in nine out of every 10 rounds of applause, Brown is either the last or the second last to start clapping. Not only is he late, but his lack of enthusiasm also shows in the slow tempo of his clapping. During Blair's speech, Brown produces a total of 322 discomfort tells. Most of these occur when Blair is riding high, when the audience is clapping or they're enjoying his jokes. When we look at the ministers nearby, we find that on average, they produce less than a fifth of the discomfort tells produced by Gordon Brown. I came here to put tells to the test, and I've discovered two things. Brown has behaved like a leader in waiting, and, for the moment at least, everyone knows that Blair still has his hands firmly on the top job. If a psychologist had a patient who displayed these signals, he'd be forgiven for thinking that he'd hit a raw nerve. It's clear that tells can help you to read the minds of politicians. But what can the secret language show us about the people who pull rank in our daily lives? The next stage of my journey takes me into new waters. I've been invited to spend the day with one of Britain's oldest institutions. I'm on my way to join one of the Royal Navy's fleet of destroyers, HMS Gloucester. The Navy is fascinating because it's a traditional and inherently hierarchical organization. There should be lots of power tells on display. As captain of the Gloucester, Commander Cree wears the badges of office. Like everyone else in the Navy, he's defined by his rank. There's something very interesting happening on board today. HMS Gloucester is taking part in war games. Everyone has been ordered to change into battle dress. Once we've finished, I should know where my weak links are, if there are any, but I'll also know that everybody is capable of doing um, the job to a certain level. And so I do trust them, and, I, and I've got to trust them. I can't control every event on board. Watch how the captain issues his commands. We keep it calm on the port side, please. This is where you see the power tells. When he's giving an order, the captain pointedly looks straight ahead. The captain doesn't orient his body towards the officer. He hardly looks at him or bothers to find out whether he's taken the order on board. We shut down the sections. Getting any information? You can see from the tells that the captain's in charge. The war games on board HMS Gloucester are designed to test the command structure. It's very important that the captain appears to be calm and collected. Now, normally this is fairly easy, but in moments of crisis, when there are lots of demands and distractions, it can be extremely difficult. It's then, when everyone is looking to the captain for guidance, that he most needs to project an image of confidence and control when the chips are down. This is where I would expect to see the captain using lots of power tells. But he isn't. Here again, he's looking ahead, but it's to monitor his computer screen, not to demonstrate that he's in charge. Do not peel over on the side of the He's definitely leading his team, 
But he's not pulling rank and he's not using power tells to assert his position. Right, Ops, follow me now. But why? I now see that Commander Cree's rank removes the need for dominance gestures. He knows his team will comply with his orders, even if they think he's wrong. Where there's time, you listen. Where there isn't time, you may have to make a snap decision, and they just have to get on with it. If they know it's wrong, if they're absolutely convinced it's wrong, then I'd expect them to at least come back one more time. But uh, no, when the decision's made, then people just have to do what they're told, basically. It might not seem like it, but what we see here is what we might witness in any office on any day. Somebody's exercising power and trying to get others to follow orders. In the modern workplace, pulling rank isn't fashionable. Especially in a company like Microsoft, which is renowned for its flat structure. Neil Holloway is one of Microsoft's 10 most powerful bosses. Watch what happens when his management team greet each other. They don't adjust their height. But look, when they shake hands with Neil, they give a slight dip of the head. They're acknowledging his seniority. See you. Welcome to the UK. Even though he's one of a new breed of non-hierarchical business leaders. You've got to have empathy and you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the, the, the employee. And if you do that, they'll open up much easier. So when someone doesn't dip their heads to Neil, what happens? This delegate is being quite familiar because he pats Neil on the shoulder. Neil isn't having it. He asserts himself and comes back with a double pat. Now that's a power tell. It's similar to what Tom Cruise did to assert himself. And what Al Gore did to George Bush. Maybe I should briefly explain. Notice Neil's gestures. Watch for the power tells. At first glance, it looks like he's using his hands to shield himself, but he's actually presenting his knuckles. It's a disguised way of being dominant. But we have to say what, we, what our goals are. It's exactly the gesture we saw Tony Blair using when he addressed the Labour Party conference. It's not the only gesture that these two bosses share. Neil uses the two-handed stab to ram home the points he's making. This is also a dominant gesture. We can see this because the wrists are stiff rather than bent. It's another gesture we've seen used by Tony Blair. The success of Neil's leadership style can be measured by looking at the tells of his audience. Most of them are producing attentiveness displays. They're covering their mouth an action that's inconsistent with talking. It's therefore an unconscious, respectful way of showing Neil that they have no intention of taking over the speaker role. Or the enterprise selling business. At Microsoft's management meeting, no one's giving orders, but it's obvious who's in charge. You can see it in the power tells. The question is, what happens to these tells when things are more relaxed? When you go down for a cup of coffee, guess what, you've got to almost act slightly differently. But again, if, if you, depending on how you talk to that person as well, if you're empathetic and you're talking the same language, you can just as easily be part of the crowd, and they, they love that, and then they also love you being the leader. Here's an informal conversation where all three men are standing with their hands on their hips. This is a dominance posture. Somebody's going to have to give way. Neil makes his move. He points at one of the other people and symbolically pushes him down. This has the desired effect because the other person folds his arms. Neil is now able to continue talking unchallenged. Even when they are being informal, the people here are constantly reaffirming their status positions in relation to each other. Most of the time people don't know they're doing this, but they can't help themselves. The tells take over. Mm -hmm. 
While I was on HMS Gloucester, I realized that power tells are much less common in the Navy than they are at Microsoft. This is not something I'd expected to find, but it makes perfect sense. Commander Cree doesn't need to enlist respect by producing dominance tells. He already has the respect of his crew by virtue of his position. But I think that in most offices, including Microsoft, we're constantly having to remind each other who's in charge. At the very top of the power pyramid in Britain sits the monarchy. The Queen is the head of state. She doesn't need to produce power tells. In fact, it's fair to say that her trademark tell is the hand clasp. She's used it throughout her reign. This, in fact, is a demure, submissive gesture. It even has an element of self-comfort about it. The Queen's job is a lonely one. She doesn't have anyone to hold her hand, so she holds it herself. Prince Philip, of course, is the consort. He is not the head of state. In contrast with the Queen, he has a habit of standing with his hands behind his back. It's his trademark tell. It's what I call the crane. This is a dominance posture because it shows that he doesn't feel any need to defend himself. In all walks of life, effective leaders are those who produce the right tells for their job, whether they're running a business, a ship, or a country. So tells show how power works in British life. But what do they reveal about Britain's place on the world stage? Who looks up to us? And who looks down? Once you know about the secret language of power, you can see the game our leaders are trying to win. Now that you've been let in on the secret of doorstep tells, you can use it to create a league table of prime ministers and presidents and spot which country's leader is top dog. Remember, the trick is to be last through the door. On his last visit to London, President Bush didn't behave like a guest. He took control, slipped his hand behind Tony Blair and guided him through his own front door. In this case, it's definitely America won Britain nil. Soon after that defeat, France's proud leader Jacques Chirac called on Tony Blair. Watch the doorstep tell. Chirac scores the victory. Once again, Tony looks like a guest on his own red carpet. This time, it's France 1, Britain 0. So what happens when Bush and Chirac, the two world-beating doyens of the doorstep, meet? Can we detect a global pecking order? Who gives way to whom? This time, Chirac was playing at home, so he had the advantage. Bush was one of the guests. When they took up their positions, there was no way of knowing who would win. Chirac made the first move, but Bush was quick to counter, getting his arm behind Chirac. Bush had taken control. It was a narrow victory. United States won, France nil. When poker players let their guard slip, they can lose money because the other players can read their tells and guess what kind of hand they've got. A politician like Gordon Brown could also be losing out. By letting his tells leak, he makes it easier to read his mind. As a result, so far at least, Tony Blair has come across as the more confident leader. But I think there's one final tell that plays a part in this, their smiles. Blair's looks real, but Brown's doesn't. If there were a competition to find the politician with the most synthetic smile, Gordon Brown would probably be the winner. His speciality is the flashbulb smile. One moment his face is in repose, the next a smile has been switched on, and a moment later it's gone and the face is back to normal. Could this even be part of the reason why Tony Blair is Prime Minister and Gordon Brown is not? 
To be successful, people in power need to understand the secret language of tells. In recent times, the leader who's done this best is Bill Clinton. As we've seen, even when he's in desperate trouble, he manages to present his best side. I have asked all for their forgiveness. He's the politician who wins the prize as the master of the tells. Clinton projects the right messages because he understands the power of tells. Most of the time, he knows exactly what he's doing. By mastering the tells, he makes himself appear both dominant and likable. But even if you have the most powerful job in the world, political power is temporary. It's overshadowed by the symbolic, almost magical power wielded by the crown. Unlike in the United States, the British head of state is not limited to two terms of four years. <laughs> when the Clintons come to Buckingham Palace, Bill is feeling uncharacteristically anxious because he ends up with one foot below the other. We can often see this awkwardness when other politicians come face to face with the Queen. Notice how the Czech president, Václav Havel, anxiously wipes his hand when he meets the Queen. The Queen often has this effect on world leaders. See how stiff George Bush looks in her presence. No sign of a power walk here. I've looked really closely at this moment and you can see how awkward Bush is feeling. Watch his hands when the American national anthem begins. He thinks it's a toast, he picks up his glass, he puts it down, and eventually he gets his hand to his chest. He's the most powerful man in the world. He can bring down countries and change the lives of everyone on the planet. But when he's next to the Queen, the American president is a bundle of nerves. By looking for the tells that they can control, we can see how the powerful are trying to influence us. By looking at the tells that they can't control, we can see their true emotions and their shortcomings. No one in power is ever safe from someone who can read their tells. For love to work, two people have to be completely in tune with each other's needs and desires. It's like a dance. If people don't move together properly, things aren't going to work out. Looking for signs of physical harmony provides us with important clues to people's relationships. The coordination displayed by a couple, the way two people move in time to each other, is what psychologists call synchrony. There's nowhere better to see this than in one of the simplest acts of love, the kiss. You might think a kiss is just a kiss, but is it? Kisses vary enormously and they are full of revealing tells. Gordon Brown may be a brilliant chancellor, but how does he rate as a kisser? He goes for his bride's lips, then when it's all over, she goes for his. They try again. But once more, their kisses are out of sync. Her kiss is over before his. This kiss is uncoordinated, but it's entirely understandable because the press are putting the newlyweds under a lot of pressure. And anyway, the Chancellor isn't used to parading his private life in front of the cameras. If you doubt the importance of synchrony, watch Kate Winslet and her first husband, Jim Threppleton. You'll see that they're out of sync. At the start, she offers the top of her head to be kissed, but then she starts to present her lips, just when he's turning away. As he turns back towards her, she presents her forehead once again, 
At no point do they seem to want the same thing. Not long after this kiss, Kate and Jim parted company. There's much more coordination between Kate Winslet and her next husband, Sam Mendes. When he signals that he's about to kiss her, she reacts immediately, making sure that she's ready by the time his lips reach hers. Their movements before, during and after the kiss are synchronized. It's all done with exquisite timing, down to a fraction of a second. When people feel the same way about each other, synchrony comes naturally. When people aren't in tune with each other, it's much more difficult for them to synchronize their actions. Forgive me if I'm repeating myself, um, but we all know that David and I know the same people. Few people genuinely believed that Liza Minnelli and her new husband were a match made in heaven. And sadly, the tells show the doubters to be correct. As she stretches towards her latest flame, you can see signs that they don't want the same thing from each other. She's hoping for a kiss, but is met with a reluctant hug. It's not what she was after. It's not a good sign. When you start reading the tells, you begin to realize that a simple little act like kissing can provide important clues to people's attitudes towards each other. It can also show who's in control. Holding someone's face during a kiss looks like a gesture of enthusiasm, but it's not. It's a disguised way of controlling the other person. At a press conference, a journalist asks Al Pacino for a kiss. I met you in New York a few years ago. You signed me an autographer and you give me a kiss. Can you do it again, please? Oh, oh. Not wanting to appear ungracious, he agrees. It's, 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 it's why I came. <laughs> Personal. Notice his fleeting facial grimace as she approaches. It shows he's having second thoughts. He's worried what she's going to do. When the kiss comes, he makes sure he's holding her face. That way he can control the kiss while giving the impression that he's enjoying it. <laughs> it's, it's really getting better all the time coming here. <laughs> People who are genuinely in love have a strong need to be physically close. One way to achieve this is by keeping their palms in contact when they're holding hands. Watch Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley. They look happy enough, but their hands are giving them away. They're using an air hold. The gap between their palms shows that they have no desire to be physically close to each other. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman are posing as a happy couple, but there's no evidence of this in their handhold. Look how the gap between their palms reflects the chasm between them, because even when she moves towards him, he doesn't acknowledge her. Tells reflect the vital signs in every relationship. But a couple's long-term success can also be predicted from the tells that appear when they declare their commitment to each other. Including the time millions of television viewers watched the culmination of the greatest fairy tale romance of modern times. By reading the tells, you can spot whose marriage is set to last and whose looks doomed. The experience of love goes hand in hand with the expression of love. Of course, people can always conceal or fake their emotions. But when it comes to love, people usually show their true feelings. That, after all, is what love is all about. As well as displaying synchrony, successful couples need to be attentive to each other. Couples who are show it in their tells. You can see it in the way they look at each other. This isn't just to check out what state their partner is in. It's also to show that they care. The messages conveyed by gays are powerful, more powerful than words.
The contrasting weddings of two of the world's most famous brothers shows how attentiveness can communicate love and how its absence can betray other feelings. When Edward and Sophie announced their engagement, many doubted that the marriage would last, but the cynics were wrong. The tells revealed that Edward and Sophie were deeply in love. It's evident in their sensitivity to each other and the way they operate as a team. Look at what happens when a journalist asks them a question. What is it that makes you get along so well? I don't know what, I don't know, we just, we just do, really. I mean, it's just... I think we share a number of interests. Yeah. Um, we laugh a lot. We have a great friendship. It's quite hard. They're both looking ahead. As the question comes to an end, Sophie turns and looks at Edward, thereby passing the question on to him. He starts to answer, fluffs it, and then looks at Sophie, effectively passing the question to her. I think we share a number of interests. She's quick on the draw and gives a very good answer. As she does, she looks at Edward, partly to address him, but also to involve him in the answer. He nods and gives her lots of supportive encouragement throughout. We have a great friendship. Yeah. What made you decide... Another journalist asks a question um, about announcing their intention to marry. Announce it or, or, or actually decide to ask the question, you mean? <laughs> so, uh, no, it's just, I, I mean, it's, it's impossible for anyone to, else to understand, you know, why it has taken me this long, but um, I don't think you'd have been right before and I don't think Sophie would have said yes if I'd said before. And hopefully by the fact she did say yes, I must have got the timing right. So, uh. <laughs> Once again, Sophie glances at Edward thereby passing the question to him. I don't know. What, announce it or, or, or actually decide to ask the question, you mean? He clarifies the question, then gives a roundabout answer. While he's doing so, he checks out Sophie to make sure she's involved and that she approves. I don't think you'd have been right before and I don't think Sophie would have said yes if I'd said before. And hopefully by the fact she did say yes, I must have got the timing right. So. Uh... <laughs> the tells show that Edward and Sophie are attentive and sensitive to each other's needs. When Charles and Diana got engaged, the tells could not have been more different. <laughs> Charles goes ahead, he's fiddling with his cuff, and they're not moving in step. They are physically attached, but it's all coming from Diana. You could take her out of the picture and Charles would look exactly the same. At this stage, Diana still had a lot to learn, and this showed in her behaviour. You can see from the way she purses her lips that she's feeling embarrassed. When they're asked if they're in love, she answers without delay. He offers that famous indirect answer. Whatever in love means. Obviously it means two very happy people. The greatest fairy tale romance in modern history seems very different when you look more closely at the tells. Watch how the two of them use their eyes. While the Archbishop is reading out the groom's vows, Diana is gazing at Charles, but Charles is watching the Archbishop. When the Archbishop reads out the bride's vows, Charles exchanges a fond, reassuring glance with Diana. That's a good sign. But from this point on, his eyes remain elsewhere. Down at the ground, up at the heavens, everywhere except at his chosen bride. By contrast, Edward and Sophie can't keep their eyes off each other. Edward is smiling, and so is Sophie. I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis, take thee, Sophie Helen. Take thee, Sophie Helen. Their actions are attentive and synchronised. When Edward places the ring on Sophie's finger, he instinctively presses the outside fingers together. He's unconsciously protecting the marriage by making sure that the ring doesn't fall off. It's often in very tiny gestures, actions that we take for granted, or which we don't even notice, that the secret language of lovers' feelings is to be found.
One of the little known tells of discomfort is this gesture. When people are feeling sad, they sometimes wipe away an imaginary tear. They don't know that they're doing it, but it's a sure sign that something is worrying them. And therefore is not Prince Charles uses this gesture right in the middle of his wedding. Unadvisedly, lightly or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God. What's worrying him? Is he lamenting his lost youth? Or is there something else on his mind? Nearly a billion people watched this wedding on television. No one spotted Charles wiping his eye, and nor did I at the time. But this tiny tell spoke volumes about his discomfort. <laughs> Observing the tells at a wedding helps to answer the question no one dares ask, will it last? It's easy to have the benefit of hindsight, but if I'd been at the wedding of Kate Winslet and Jim Threppleton, and I'd been watching the tells, I would probably have predicted that they were in for a bumpy ride. As they emerge from the church, they're tugging in different directions. She pulls one way and he pulls another. You get a distinct feeling that they're dancing to different tunes. Their attention is all over the place. They're seldom focused on each other. And when they do finally kiss for the cameras, it's uncoordinated. In fact, she kisses him so intensely that he's forced to draw back. It's not a good start, in spite of what Kate has to say. Good day for you. Absolutely wonderful. Absolutely in wonderful. fact, the marriage lasted just over three years. The TV presenter Zoe Ball and the DJ Norman Cook also began their married life with the wedding tells sounding a loud warning. When they appear for the photo shoot, he assumes the role of bridesmaid, fussing over her dress. Zoe is orchestrating the occasion and Norman is looking lost. You can see it in his submissive cant of the head. As they kiss for the cameras, she clasps his head in her hands. She's not being passionate, she's calling the shots. It's the same head hold we saw with Al Pacino. The tells on a wedding day can often show what lies ahead, but any couple can find out if they're suited long before they marry. In fact, they could know from the very first moment they meet. First meetings are critical. In fact, they're probably the most crucial staging post in a relationship. It's by looking at first meetings that we can tell if people are attentive to each other and whether things are going to work out. Where better to see this than at a speed dating evening where instant chemistry holds the key to finding love? At tonight's event, there are 40 guests, 20 men and 20 women, and they've all been given scorecards. We are going to have the girls sitting down and the boys... They'll tick the dates they like, and if a date ticks them too, they'll be given the opportunity to meet again later. But for the moment, if you want to go and sit down, OK, I hope you'll have fun. The encounters are three minutes long. Research on relationships reveals that people often form an impression of each other within the first five seconds. These processes are clearly at work here. We can see it in their eyes and in their facial expressions. While they're checking each other out, the speed daters are also trying to appear friendly, interesting and attractive. To appear attentive, they lean forward, gaze intently and nod. They may be anxious, but outwardly they're giving the impression that they're composed. And they're also trying to make their date feel relaxed.
One thing guaranteed to help someone relax is laughter. One of the clues as to whether or not a relationship is going to work out is laughter. Men love nothing more than to make a woman laugh. And what women are looking for is a man who makes them laugh. <laughs> That's why people rate a sense of humour in a potential mate so highly. You'll often see men trying to make women laugh. Laughter is an integral part of sexual attraction. Psychologists have discovered that the more a woman laughs during a first date, the keener she is to meet the man again. Surprisingly, laughter and smiling are quite different things. They are performing very different functions. Women smile much more than men. That's partly because the smile serves as a signal of appeasement. Men often try to appear dominant by not smiling. But when they meet a girl for the first time, they smile much more. It's a way of showing that they aren't a threat. To find out how men and women differ in their approach to first meetings, I decided to track two of the speed daters. I chose them because I thought they'd be attractive to the opposite sex. The first was Chris. Chris is a big smiler, never failing to disarm his date. He's attentive and encouraging. He's always eager to ask the girls about themselves. Are you from that neck of the woods originally? Yeah. He's got lots of questions. Unfortunately, they tend to be stock questions. It sounds more like an interview than a conversation. Mag, what do you like doing in your spare time? You like? What sort of man are you looking for then? You haven't been watching the rugby on the TV yet. What do you do for fun then? Do you, do you work around this part of town? Or what do you like doing? What's your, what's your uh, recreation of choice? But this doesn't mean he's doing badly. It's just a typically male approach to a social situation. Mix, boys and girls? Yeah. I also tracked Vicky. Her approach is very different from Chris's. She's adaptive. With every date, she asks different questions and the conversations evolve spontaneously. Oh, you're all right. Hello, all right, mate. How are you doing? Not bad, so. Good. I'll tell you about my kind of my activities outside work. Fine. They're, they're more interesting. That's to fantastic see. because I'd rather not talk about work as well, so bring it on. Like half an hour on the yes. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Notice her attentiveness and the animation in her face when she's asking a question. I didn't actually have time for that. She widens her eyes and raises her eyebrows. As soon as she's completed the question, she stops talking and gives her date a chance to respond. She opens her mouth as a sign of astonishment, nods her head in encouragement and raises her eyebrows to show how impressed she is. She's showing her date that she's interested in what he has to say and that she can identify with his feelings. Actually, um, not go out every single night, not Although she doesn't know it, Vicky is displaying her facial facility. Her tells demonstrate that she's capable of a wide range of emotions and that she knows how to display them appropriately. In evolutionary terms, she's telling him that she would make a sensitive mate and a caring mother. An hour and a half of yoga. Good man. <laughs> wow. So, I'm actually feeling very... At, peace myself. At the end of the evening, it's no surprise that every one of the 20 men ticked Vicky. Chris was the most popular man at the event. 13 women ticked him. When it comes to first impressions, there's no doubt that women have the upper hand. On average, the men ticked twice as many people as the women. Although we don't know it, we're constantly sending and receiving sexual messages. Other people are looking us over and deciding whether we are attractive, and we're doing the same to them. Speed dating is built on first impressions. There's very little time for much more than that. But a typical night on the town is a much more complex situation for would-be lovers. So how do people approach each other, appear seductive, and ward off competition? We're about to find out. Imagine what it would be like to be a fly on the wall for a whole evening when men and women are busy sizing each other up. You could study all the unspoken exchanges between them, every nervous glance, every flirtatious gesture, every tell they needed to exchange for a love affair to get started. 
That's exactly what I'll be doing tonight. I'm hosting a unique party. It could be any bar, any club, any Saturday night, but it's not. We've invited 15 single men and 15 single women, and we've set up cameras in every corner of the room. We'll be watching out for all the little telltale signs they send to people they fancy and the people they don't. I'm going to scrutinize what happens between my 30 guests over the next four hours. Being in a bar may never feel the same again. Welcome to the Love Lab. A bit grooving, moving, see what happens. I got on with him really well. Well, she's not the most friendly. Not more. I don't normally use chat up lines and things like that because um, it doesn't really work. Did you do anything to encourage it? No. But I have actually got um, a chat up line book. It's always the way, isn't it, though? You know, he'd probably be a friend. Yeah, we've got on very well. We seem to be at the same sort of level. Beggars can't be choosers, really, you know what I mean? The female guests have been asked to arrive early and are getting to know each other. How will the behaviour of the women change when the men enter the room? As the men start to arrive, we see them flicking their hair. The hair flick is a classic example of preening. Preening helps a girl in several ways. First, she's showing her crowning glory, a soft, bouncy, youthful feature she's proud of. Then she's telling the man she's noticed him. She's saying, look at my hair and look at me. Among women, preening is not only common, it's contagious. Three of the four girls in this group preen themselves by flicking their hair. One, two, three. It's like a Mexican wave. In a competitive environment, all the girls want to make sure that they're looking their best. Men like to think that they do all the running and that they make the first move. But watch how it's actually the women who initiate things. Okay, now let's just see if we can track this way. Let's slow time down and study in detail what happens when Richard arrives at the party. From the moment that Kate spots Richard, she doesn't stop staring. He notices this and looks back at her. Kate's friend Sarah also turns and looks at Richard and flicks her hair appreciatively. These glances take less than a second, but this moment may change their evening. It could even change their lives. Courtship is almost always a matter of female choice, and in a bar, it's the woman who invariably makes the first move. She does this by producing an approach tell. Anton and Marius move towards a group of girls. They're waiting for an approach tell. Jasmine on the left spots them standing alone. She stares at them and gives them a smile. This is an approach tell. It says to the guys, you may approach me now. Yvonne turns to see the guys and also smiles, sending the same signal. Without an approach tell, you may as well not be there. One of these men is part of the group. The other isn't, but wishes he were. He steps forward, tries to be physically involved, but to no avail. Even when he's left alone with the girls, a perfect opportunity to move in, he stands there expectantly, watching them, patiently waiting for an inviting signal from one of them. But it never comes. Without an approach tell from one of the girls, there's very little he can do to be accepted. So he carries on, looking slightly lost and waiting. Kate and Sarah are still talking to Richard. It's evident that they both like him, but it's difficult because they're close friends. Look how they use their hair, their mouth and their eyes to keep Richard's attention. 
Kate raises her shoulder, fixes her eyes on Richard and smiles. This is a coquettish gesture and it's designed to grab his attention. As soon as Kate becomes flirtatious, Sarah averts her eyes and withdraws. When Kate realises that her friend has withdrawn, she points at Sarah, involving her once again. There are other subtle signs of friendly competition between the two girls. Sarah exposes her neck. This is a submissive, flirtatious gesture because it presents a very vulnerable part of the body. It says, look, I'm not a threat. I trust you not to harm me. Kate goes to the bar and as she passes Richard, she discreetly pats him on the bum. This is definitely a provocative gesture. It's below the belt and it's very early in the encounter. It says to Richard, don't forget me, I'll be back. We can see that Kate has managed to arouse Richard because while she's away, he's constantly looking out for her. Move over. That's it. Beverly and John have been chatting to each other for ages. They're oriented towards each other, ignoring everything and everyone else. How do we know whether he's equally committed to her? Well, let's just look at his feet. There you are, legs crossed. That's a very important tell. It tells us, but not necessarily him or her, that he's entirely committed to that conversation. He has absolutely no intention of moving on. Sarah has also crossed her legs. She too has no intention of leaving. Richard is still looking around. He's missing Kate. Now it's Sarah's chance to make a move. One of the things you'll find is that women often preen themselves when they've lost the attention of the guys they've been talking to. Watch how she uses her hair, her mouth and her eyes. Sarah preens the right side of her body almost as if she's trying to draw Richard away from the center of the room where Kate is to be found. She becomes more animated in an attempt to hold his attention. Now she deploys her killer tell, the eye pop. She closes her eyes and then opens them, pop, fixing him with a loving stare. This seems to be working because Richard is much more engaged in the conversation. But Sarah's not entirely at ease because she keeps glancing to her left, keeping a lookout for Kate. She sees that Kate is busy elsewhere, so she produces a barrage of flirtatious tells. There's a little head cant, then there's an eye pop, followed by an exaggerated look of incredulity. After that, she raises her eyebrows, flicks her hair, and produces an empathic grimace. But has the barrage of tells worked? When Kate returns, she picks up where she left off. Sarah doesn't continue to make a play for Richard because she looks away and detaches herself. Beverly and John are still talking, but her feet show that the mood has changed. John's legs are still crossed. He's quite happy, but Beverly's right foot is pointing into the crowd. It's an unconscious intention movement. The chemistry is not working at the moment. She's obviously looking for something better. She wants to move on. Her facial expressions are now much more controlled, and when she gets a chance, she looks away. John is now using much more exaggerated hand movements, trying to keep their conversation alive, but it's a losing battle. He cracks a joke, and they part company. Looking lost and tense, he takes a swig looks at his watch and then releases the tension. Anton is bored and looking round the room. Now it's his turn to move on and he knows exactly where he's going. Kate is the target. He shakes only her hand and secures a hug. 
Kate turns her body towards Richard and Sarah when she puts her arm around Anton. She's reducing the intimacy of the hug and showing the others what she's doing. She's making it look friendly and nothing more. She pats Anton on the back just before the two of them let go. Pats like these pretend to be a gesture of affection, but they're not. They are a release signal. They tell the other person that it's time to let go. Richard, Kate and Sarah have spent a lot of time together. The tales show that Richard is interested in Kate. They also reveal that Richard regards Anton's arrival as a serious threat. Although Richard is doing his best to hide his feelings, he's giving off distress signals. There's a distinct lack of expression. See how he runs his tongue over his teeth. They are his primitive weapons. It's a disguised signal of aggression. When he shakes hands with Anton, Richard tries to appear relaxed. He's smiling furiously, but it's a completely fake smile. He's deeply unhappy. One tell really gives away his discomfort. His chin is pulled back. This is the chin tuck. It's what we do when we are feeling threatened. We react as if someone is about to punch us metaphorically on the chin. To make matters worse, Marius arrives. Despite Richard's insecurity, the physical arrangement of the group is revealing. The two girls have lined up beside Richard. They're showing their allegiance to him. But this doesn't stop them sending flirtatious signals to Anton and Marius. Women flirt with men even when they are not sexually interested in them. That's partly because, for lots of girls, flirting is like good manners. It's something you do even though you don't mean it. This also explains why Vicky, at the end of the speed dating night, only ticked two of the men, but was ticked by all 20 of them. Any regrets? Um, Kate's nice. Kate's very nice. Did he flirt with you? No. Did he fancy you? No. Did you flirt with him in any way? No. I know you might think I did. <laughs> but why would I think you did? What did you do? I'm just smiley and nice to people. I think that maybe that might be misinterpreted as being flirtatious. Men are notoriously poor at decoding women's signals. But if they're always receiving seemingly positive feedback, no wonder they're so confused. So we've seen how tells can reveal the secret dynamics of relationships from first meeting to marriage. But how do couples show that they're together? How do they protect their relationship? And in spite of their best efforts, how do the tells reveal illicit affairs? We've seen that people who are in love often mirror each other's actions. They move together and they're in step. But in established relationships, other tells appear. They are to do with possession, dominance and deception. It's sometimes very difficult to know what's happening in other people's relationships, or even one's own. But when you learn to read the secret language of tells, all that changes. So what can we learn by watching celebrity couples as they strut their stuff along the red carpet? When celebrity couples appear in public, there can sometimes be a problem if one of them gets more attention than the other. John Travolta and his wife Kelly Preston are being interviewed at a movie premiere. 
the focus is entirely on John. The combination is, uh, gives you an actor something to do. Kind of, uh... We can see that Kelly feels left out because she flicks her hair. She wants some attention. She realises that she's not going to get any, so she gives up and gives her husband a supportive and loving look. Here at this year's BAFTAs, it's the other way around. Holly Hunter is coming down the red carpet with her partner. The adulation's all for her. She's looking at the fans, he's looking ahead. She lets go of his hand and goes to sign autographs. He's not getting any attention. But he doesn't flick his hair. Instead, he puts his hand on Holly's shoulder. This is what's called a tie sign. It's a public signal that they are connected, that figuratively they're tied together. It's a cold night and she's got a bare back and that's ostensibly why he's rubbing her so vigorously. But there's something else going on because when someone offers her a shawl, he carries on where he left off. This simple little action is actually performing several relationship tasks at the same time. It's telling everyone that he's used to touching her in an intimate way. And it's a reminder to her that he's still there. But it also tells the adoring fans that while they can enjoy her for the moment, she belongs to him. That's a classic mate-guarding display. It's a possessive term. Chris Evans goes one stage further and pats his wife Billy Piper on the bottom. This is meant to look like an intimate little gesture between lovers, but in fact it's a more overt mate-guarding display. It's designed to remind everyone that she's his. There are other ways that couples show their possessiveness and lay claims to each other's attention. Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas are attending a premiere for one of her films. Even though Michael's a star in his own right, this time all eyes are on Catherine. They're holding hands, but she's got the front hold and he's got the back hold. It's not because she's taller, it's because she's in control. Michael touches Catherine possessively, working his hand up her back. She obviously doesn't want this distraction because her hand comes round and flicks him off. It's not what she wants. He moves away, looking dejected. She grabs his hand. Once again, she's got the front hold position. She's clearly enjoying the attention because she's not looking at Michael at all. But this time, he doesn't touch her, he uses his eyes. Watch how Michael stares at her. This looks like adoration, but it isn't. It's an eye pull. Michael is feeling left out. He's using his eyes to get Catherine to acknowledge him so that he can feel part of the action. The tells show that people who are in established relationships behave quite differently from those who are in the early stages of courtship. The emotional evolution of relationships, the way they grow or decay, is always articulated in couples' tells. In the early days of Charles and Diana's marriage, it seemed to many that they were dancing to the same tune. Um, you got a plastic whale that throws things out the top, little balls. <laughs> there were signs of loving collusion, as well as examples of physical intimacy. Here, for example, he teases her by touching her on the bum, and she responds playfully. When Charles and Diana started to become estranged, they tried to put on a brave face, but their worsening relationship and the misery they were experiencing showed in the tells. The story the tells reveal about Diana is that in public she learned how to play to the cameras, but in private, when she wasn't aware she was being filmed, the tells revealed the truth. Her emotions were too strong for her to keep hidden. The true nature of a relationship is revealed to the world through tells, through synchrony, attentiveness, intimacy and tie signs. During the early part of Prince Charles's relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles, there weren't any of these signs on show, 
because their affair was deliberately kept out of the public eye. When they attended a public function together, Charles would leave first. Camilla would leave afterwards. Here we can see her trying to slip away unnoticed. All of this might have changed in 1999, when Charles and Camilla appeared at the Ritz Hotel in London. Officially, they were now together, but were they in step? The watching public didn't know where the relationship was heading because even when they were seen together, it still wasn't clear what Charles and Camilla felt about each other. That's because the tells were being suppressed. The uncertainty about her role may also explain why Camilla is so uneasy with the public and the media. Camilla is with the Beaufort Hunt. She's waiting for the start. She knows she's being watched and it's making her feel anxious. We can see this from the way she swivels her head and repeatedly licks her lips, a sure sign that she's feeling nervous. Her reactions are very different from those of Diana. But how do tells help at the sharp end of marriage when one side has been unfaithful? Can you tell when your partner is lying? Let's explore the marriage of one of the world's most prominent couples. William Jefferson Clinton. Bill Clinton had a real problem over the Monica Lewinsky affair. Thank you, Mr. While most men who are caught with their pants down have to explain themselves in private, he had to do so in front of a grand jury and millions of television viewers. Asked you if she believed that the de definition of sexual relationship was two people having intercourse, then this is accurate. Clinton had worked out his version of events, and he was sticking to it. That depends on what was in her mind. I don't know what was in her mind. You'll have to ask her that. Like every man who stands accused of infidelity, he was struggling to appear composed and to be convincing. Look at the tells on display. I do. If you were his wife, would you believe him? Here are the things to look out for. First, there's his blink rate. If it's faster than usual, it means that the person is under pressure and it can be an indicator of lying. Here, there are 60 blinks per minute. That's three times the normal rate. And if you say two people are having a sexual relationship, most people believe that includes intercourse. There are signs of deception in his hands. Clasping them together is a way of symbolically concealing his thoughts. It's also a means of self-comfort. But there's another gesture here which reveals what's going on in Clinton's mind. See how he forms a fist and covers it with the other hand. He's feeling aggressive but trying to hide it. He's also using his hands to partially cover his mouth. That's a way of concealing what he's got to say. This gesture is frequently associated with lying. When it comes to lying, the mouth is the most revealing part of the body. His mouth is feeling dry. That's why he licks his lips so often. A dry mouth is a classic sign of anxiety, frequently associated with telling lies. That's also why he's feeling thirsty. If you were Mrs. Clinton and you knew all this, you would not be happy. No, sir, I didn't do that. We all use tells to make others trust us, love us, and sometimes just to get our own way. They are the building blocks of every relationship. Without them, we could not move from one stage of a relationship to the next. Once you can read the tells, other people's relationships become an open book. But the language of tells also helps us to discover what our own partner feels about us and what we really feel about them. The secret language of tells can expose the love life of presidents, princesses and movie stars. It can also reveal the truth about yours.